Wait, before you listen to this episode, I just had to tell you about our new free mini wealth building training. In this training, we're covering the first steps to building wealth, how to find your personalized wealth path, how to find and analyze deals, and then some. So don't miss out on this free training. I mean, what do you have to lose? It's free. Sign up at www.abundantculture.co slash newsletter. Don't let delay get in the way of your abundant year. Now, back to the episode. Welcome back to Abundant Culture Podcast. Where we dissect the mindsets and tactics of the true beast of business. People like Gary Vee, Grant Cardone, and Warren Buffett. All to create a blueprint to experience life more abundantly. Hey everybody, it's Joe here. Welcome back to the Abundant Culture Podcast. We're so glad to have you back again this week. Today, we are interviewing a multifamily expert, but not only is he a multifamily expert, he is a expert in personal development. And this is gonna be a very unique podcast because a lot of people say, hey, I wanna invest in apartment complexes. What do I do? How do I go about that? But a lot of people ignore the personal growth and development that goes into becoming the person that has the ability to pull together deals like that. And what we're going to talk about today is not only multifamily strategy that you can learn from many other different podcasts, but we're going to talk about how do you work on yourself as an individual so that you have the capacity to pull together those different multifamily deals. We're going to talk about personal development. We're going to talk about some multifamily myths, and we're going to talk about a whole bunch more things. So get ready to listen to and learn from our good friend, Jerome Myers. Hi, Jerome, and thank you again so much for coming on to the Abundant Culture Podcast. We are super excited to have you today because I absolutely love your energy. I always see you on LinkedIn, and lately we've been talking so much within the mastermind that we're a part of. So before we get into like all the business and real estate side of things, we have to ask you, what is your backstory? How'd you get into business? Oh, I'm a corporate America dropout, right? I In my last job, I built a $20 million division for a Fortune 550 company. And I was employee number two. I started on January 13th of 2015. And by the end of September of that year, we had 175 people on my team and went through the end of the year, $20 million in revenue, uh, $6 million in profit. And my reward for that was laying those hardworking people off, at least half of them. And so that part was pretty frustrating for me. It's probably the most traumatic experience I've ever had. And I got that call on Christmas Eve saying, hey, Jerome, you know, we can get somebody else to make these decisions for you, but you are responsible for the team. You're going to have to do it again in 2016. You probably want to make these decisions. And uh, I struggled with that. I was like, okay, I kind of get it. Went back to uh, the playground days, right? And you pick your, you're the captain of the team. You pick who you want on your team and you probably don't want to be the kid who gets picked last, right? But at the end of the day, I had to make those tough choices. Promised myself I'd never do it again. Fast forward to Thanksgiving of the following year, I'm asked to do the same thing. And I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. And so I dropped out and didn't really have much of a plan on what I was going to do next. I've been dabbling in real estate. I was a private money lender, was learning about the fix and flip business, but didn't actually have a plan on what I was going to do next. And so I thought about it more and more. I was like, hey, when I was in college, Duran and I were sitting on a stoop. And when we did the math, this guy was making $100,000 a year owning apartments. Why don't I go do that? And so I started searching LoopNet and all the other sources for online deals. And I came up with one. And then I started going from bank to bank saying, hey, don't you want to give me a million dollars to buy this thing? And they all told me no. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, I got money. I got credit. Like, why wouldn't you give me money to do this? He was like, you're not qualified. Like, Wait, I got an engineering license and an MBA. He's like, yeah, so what? You're not qualified professional engineering license, like project management professional, like all these things corporate America says is super important. Yeah. Nah, that you need to sign a loan on a deal with a similar business plan and show us that you successfully executed that. And that will get your opportunity to lend to us, assuming that you have the right net worth and liquidity. I was like, I don't understand any of these things you're talking about. Like, this is the asset. Give me the money for the asset that I'm buying. Anyway, so I started fixing and flipping houses. And, you know, after getting turned down like 10 times and I'm sitting on a scoop one day 
And the guy pulls up. He's like, hey, let me check out your finishes. We're getting ready to do one down the street. And I was like, okay, okay, let's come check it out. You know, I'm proud. You know, some things are going the way it's supposed to go now. And people want to see what we're doing because I'm a fix and flipper, general contractor, all these things. And he's like, yeah, so I'm getting ready to make an offer on a building. I was like, a building? Yeah, that's cool. I tried to buy that one four or five months ago. And please don't leave me out of the deal because they said I should have partnered with somebody with experience and you have experience. So you're the guy I've been looking for. And he's like, what are you going to bring to the table? I said, I don't know. We'll figure it out. Just don't leave me out. And sure enough, he went and made the offer without me because I couldn't articulate my value to the deal. And his offer got rejected. So he went and talked to one of my buds and he's like, hey, I need you to be a general contractor. You build in this neighborhood. You know, you'll be a great asset to the team. He said, oh, Jerome was talking about that deal back in January, February. Uh, I'm not doing it unless he does. It. And so then I got a seat at the table, right? I got brought in to do project management stuff. I, I wasn't smart enough to say, hey, I got a project management background. I can manage this thing for us. And then we brought in a property manager and the broker who put the deal together also joined us on the team. And so that was our first joint venture. It was a 23 unit in Richmond, Virginia. And we did all kinds of stuff. It was kind of insane. Roof siding, added a bathroom on the first floor. It's a slab. So we had jackhammers and we went through the concrete to add new piping, um, laundry room. Then we did like all the upgrades, stainless steel, granite, tile throughout, uh, luxury vinyl plank, like touched every surface. Yeah. And everything that you could have done wrong, we did wrong. Like literally everything. Like we didn't get permits. And so then we put stuff in that wasn't like acceptable. So they made us take it back out. We had drawings that weren't approved. They like, this is wrong. And so like, it took us like a year and a half to get permits in a city where you can get them in like 30 days. I mean, the partnership, like we didn't want to meet. So we, I send long emails to try to communicate the points. And they're like, I'm not reading that. Like we should have a meeting to talk about this. I was like, but you said you don't have time to meet. Like, what are we doing? And so I just learned so much in that deal. Grateful you know, we got into it and it wasn't all bad. Like we bought it with average rents at 695. We expected like 895 on the backside of the renovation, but we were able to get 1190. And so anybody who understands the math of apartments knows that that's what you like absolutely want to do. But we didn't plan all of that, right? It just kind of happened. And I think that's the thing that I struggle with most is like, you know, in certain situations or circumstances, you end up getting the result that you want or a result better than what you wanted. But you're being pretty egotistical if you take credit for something that you didn't plan. And so I feel like I said a lot there. I'll pause and let you guys dive in and see where we want to take this rocket ship. Yeah. Yeah. That, it was great though. Like that's a very, I feel like that's a very unique uh, story and perspective of kind of like stumbling into real estate. And I think in real estate, uh, I think you brought up uh, ego and there's a lot of people who would be like, Oh yeah, I plan to get, eleven hundred dollar rents and it's like maybe not it, it kind of depends if you're like super seasoned you probably you might have planned for it but even there's guys that's like super seasoned and i i got included on a deal luckily i got a chance to raise capital for a deal and that deal is beating its previous projections but at the same time it's like that that's not what they actually like really plan for so it's like a good thing but at the end of the day they're like humble enough to be like oh yeah we didn't know that was gonna happen but it turned out pretty good yeah. <laughs> like one of the units that they had to gut anyway ended up burning up <laughs> so they just started on that one first yeah i think the majority of people like well i'll say it this way whenever i put a pro forma together i know one thing the numbers that are on that paper aren't going to be the numbers that come out on the backside. That's yeah. the only thing I know. Now, the goal is to make sure that, you know, my income number is lower than the number I expect to get. And my expense number is higher than the number I expect to get. But I don't even get that right sometimes. So at the end of the day, like, all I know is that's wrong. And yeah, we absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so would you mind talking to us about the branding behind your company and why you chose to do the matrix theme uh, behind everything that you're doing? Yeah, I, at the highest level, like I believe the matrix was a documentary, right? A lot of people think it's some, some abstract sci-fi film without a whole lot of meaning. But for me, it's the reality of the situation. I think everybody is or should be the hero of their own story. Absolutely. Right? You, everybody wants to be their Neo. And then everybody has their Morpheus that is giving them the opportunity to make a decision. It's a fork in the road yeah. and they're offering them the blue or the red pill. And you can go back and be fat, dumb and happy and ignorant 
and blissful, or you can actually kind of take a step back and really see the situation for what it is and understand how you fit into the construct. And from there, decide if you're going to participate in the rules that were set by somebody else that may not be serving you. And back in 2012, I had a teammate from high school who died. You know, he was like 30 years old or something and one of the best human beings that I've ever met pound for pound. And it was there that I I really began asking the question like, well, if he could die, then am I actually living out like my true purpose, my true pursuits? And am I truly taking advantage of the breath that I still have here? Because I mean, for any stretch of imagination, I should be gone way before him. And so, you know, I, I kept building on that and it was a three hour drive to the funeral and I got there like three hours early and I'm going through all these questions. And so I, you know, I didn't sit in a parking lot for three hours. So I went back and sat in front of my old house and started thinking about the journey and kind of how I got to where I got to at that point. You know, I was fortunate enough to be a hundred thousand plus dollar earner when I was 26. And so it was like, I had this rocket ship attached to my career. And in some ways I was like, well, that's golden handcuffs because I can't just, because I've created this lifestyle and I'm used to this income, I can't just go do X, Y, and Z, right? Like I've got responsibilities. I've made these decisions and I've created this lifestyle. And it was at that moment that I said, well, but do I, like, do I have to continue down this path that I was on? And there was a couple of years before that when I was in a really dark place and I hated my job and didn't really feel like I could do much right in life that started peeling back the layers and asked the really contrarian questions. What, what do you really believe? And it's something as simple as if somebody sneezes and you don't say, bless you, are you a rude person, right? Like what is the real meaning behind that? And what I understood was there's a bunch of stuff that we do because we're programmed to do it and not because we choose to believe it. And when I started like peeling those layers all the way back and digging deep on that, it was a reality shock that I don't think a whole lot of people are ready for. And so if I bring it back to the matrix, I I wanted to be in a place where I would learn rapidly. I would be able to maximize my ability and in some ways be in my superpower, right? And be able to be a genius on certain things. And the thing that I, I've really worked hard to be a genius on is helping people manifest their dreams, right? I think a lot of people stop dreaming as kids or at least stop talking about their dreams. And I've seen a lot of relationships and I applaud you guys for doing what you're doing as a couple, because I see a lot of people just going off and doing their own thing. And they're kind of like roommates that come back together, but then they go off and do their own thing. And there is no real commonality in the relationship. And are they seeking the support from people outside of the home instead of getting it where they, they live. And it's just like, if you can't get support at home, where can you actually get support? And that for me is like super terrifying, but it's something that's a real thing. And I think people are really working through those. So. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. So then um, I think you kind of answered this question, but I just want you to dive a little bit deeper into it. Would you recommend for everyone to take the red pill? Or would you say that, you know, that's not really a good thing for everyone? I, I do think everyone should take the red pill. I don't think everybody is ready for the red pill, but when they are ready, I think they absolutely should take it. And so I don't, this will be the first podcast where I actually explain what the red pill is because everybody knows that it's kind of a homage to the matrix, but the reality of the situation is there's so many different layers underneath it, right? And so what the red pill is, is our centered approach to life. I think a lot of people say, oh, I got to go put on this mask to go over here and I got to put this mask on to go over there. Instead of showing up as who they are fully in every space that they show up. And for me, that's a challenge because it's absolutely exhausting. If you've got to pretend to be one way over here and then another way over there and then another way in that next room, you're confused about who you truly are. And when you actually accept that this is who I am and not like the BS, right, where you're not performing at a high level, but when you're showing up as your best self in every space that you show up in, then I think you want to be that person because you're being true to your identity. Yeah. The red pill is, it's a circular model. And if anybody wants to see it all broken out, they can uh, go to uh, jeromemeyers.co. 
But the, the center circle, and it's an inside out process. That's why you have to take the red pill. It's self is self image, right? And so with self image, we are working on a way that the relationship that you have with yourself, the way you think about yourself, that identity, that label that you put on yourself, whatever it is, we get that super clear so that when you go in places, it shows up and you have no hesitations about showing up as that person because that's who you are and that's who you want the world to see. A lot of times there's a disconnect. A per- the world sees you this way, you think about yourself that way, and it's like, ah, oh, I don't know what to do. And you're always in these, like, you're fighting with yourself. There's no reason to fight with yourself. Let's get clear about who that is and then present that to the world. From yourself, you go to the relationships. And a lot of people say, oh yeah, well, I got my partner, or I got my spouse, yeah, that's my relationships. Or I got my kids, that's my, no, it's everybody that you relate with, right? So you got people at work, you got people at the grocery store, your neighbors, like all these people, but because you've gotten true about who you are and how you show up, now they should be reflecting that back to you because you started with you. And I think this is where I most people aren't ready for the red pill. Most people want to go out into the world and have the world change. Yeah. They don't want to do any of their own work. And so when you get ready to do your own work, you're ready for the red pill. And now you went from yourself to the people around you. And the one thing that we check on when we're coaching folks is, are your relationships mutually beneficial? Yeah. If your relationships are one way, and I've been a ton of one way relationships, then I recommend that you either reposition a relationship so that it's mutually beneficial or you end the relationship because the person is not adding value to your world because we don't have room for just for withdrawals, right? We've got to have deposits and withdrawals and it doesn't matter what the relationship is. There's got to be deposits from both ends to make sure that it's not overdrafted, right? right. So the next level is this is three of the six is work, right? So you got your self image, you got your relationships. Now that you're relating well with people, you are able to expand your responsibilities and align your responsibilities with the things you're most passionate about because you're showing up that way, right? They can see, oh yeah, this is important to me. Whether it's something as simple as I've committed to my wife that I'm gonna come home for dinner and I'm gonna be at the table at six o'clock every night. Well, that's the commitment that you've made. People are gonna honor that because that's how you show up. And I mean, other things that go into that but that's just kind of a really basic example of that from the re- from the work we go out to health and we do the first three things first right we we, we do self-image relationship and work first because those are the biggest causes of stress in your world yeah if we can get those situated then we can work on your health because if those other things aren't three things aren't situated, you will self-destruct. You will do behaviors that aren't good for you. You won't sleep. You'll use drugs, including alcohol. You'll eat inappropriately, like whatever it is. You won't exercise, like whatever it is that you do to try to make yourself feel better. You'll do those things when those things aren't at peace. And so then we work on health and we work on health before we work on prosperity, because if you don't have your health, the health is going to take everything from your prosperity. So we continue to work our way out. And then the final level is self-actualization or what we call significance, right? And so this is where you're going out into the world and you're making a huge impact on the folks that you come in contact with. I We start inside out because like the people on the airplane say, you got to put your mask on first, right? You put your mask on first, get yourself in order, get things situated, and then you can go be a beacon of hope and joy and freedom to those people who are on the outside and share that message in a big way. And you can do it authentically because you took the red pill. So, I mean, that's the red pill in a nutshell. That's awesome. Yeah, I would definitely say everybody does need it. Then now that you like laid it all out for us. Yeah. So one thing I was wondering is that with all that uh, that you said, would you would you tell somebody? Let's say somebody wanted to uh, get into the multifamily business. Are you, would you say that that's the journey that they should actually start to take first? Because I love what you're saying, and what I found is that there was a lot of a lot of inner work to be done before my business could grow at all, really. Um, and I felt that I kept hitting this ceiling no matter what I would do. I mean, I would like, I, I would market. I, I got the best that I could possibly get at, you know, pitching and sales and stuff like that. And it was like nothing else was happening until I worked on myself. So what what would you say, um, should that journey, should you uh, pursue your multifamily journey uh, while you go through this process or go through this process first, then pursue multifamily? 
I think it's a chicken and egg question, right? You can go do all the work on yourself, but until you hit the challenge, you won't realize that you didn't actually do the work. And the way I like to describe it is, hey, I, I thought I already fixed that, right? Like if, if I have one coaching client and he's like, yeah, I thought I already fixed that. I was like, yeah, but as soon as somebody touches what you think is healed, it hurts. Like yeah. you think whatever scars you have on your body, like it's when it's healed, then you can touch it and it doesn't hurt. But as long as somebody can touch it and it hurt, then you end up in a place where things are not what you want them to be, right? And so we really got to do the healing piece of it in order to get there with the caveat that like, I don't think that you just work on yourself. And I'll take it a step further. If your financial house isn't in order, the only thing that you should be doing is educating yourself on real estate. If you, you're not in a good financial situation, don't try to go buy something because you're just going to add pressure to something that's already, that's not working already. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely love that piece um, because we always say to um, people like that come to us and they're asking us like, um, you know, how do I, how do I get into real estate? How do I buy businesses? Like, how do I raise capital? And it's like, you can't do anything until you, you know what you're doing. Yeah. So I absolutely love that you brought that up because that is so, so important. Yeah. I think every, I think every investor is working on four challenges and I think a lot of people get them out of order and I'll walk you guys through the four in order to save people a ton of time. And people may argue with me, but I know it to be true because I've watched so many people go through it in the wrong order and I've seen the people and how quickly they go through it when they do it in the right order. The first one is knowledge. Right. Knowledge is foundational and you apply that knowledge to leads so that you can figure out whether or not you have deals. Once you have a deal, you need experience so that you can close that deal. And if you have experience, then you need capital because that's the missing link of everything. People want to talk about capital all the time because they can look in their bank account and say, hey, this is what I actually need in order to close a deal. Yeah. But you're not going to buy something. Right. This isn't like something you go get off the shelf, but that's what we're taught. And this goes back to being uh, the blue pill, right? As a consumer, we're taught we need money to go buy something. That's not actually what you need. You need the experience to be able to operate the building because you're buying a business, Mm -hmm. right? You do multifamily, you're buying a business. So you need the experience and experience usually brings the capital. If you got, you're valuable to the experience partner and you're valuable to the capital, but it is not if I have a deal, the money will show up. People want to skip that step. The experience actually matters in multifamily because it's not buy low, sell high. Yeah. You don't know if you have a deal if you don't have the knowledge. And people want to skip over knowledge. I listen to podcasts, and this is my favorite examples, and I'll share with you guys. I've done it a few times, but Jasmine, I am, I need you to talk to Joseph, right? Mm-hmm. I've got this great deal. I am going to start my MMA career, right? I'm a, my first fight is with Conor McGregor. I need half a million dollars in order to register for the fight. If, if I win, I'll be able to give you 20% on the money you give me, right? If I lose, I lose everything, right? I need, I've I've watched YouTube videos, I've read books, I've listened to podcasts. So I know I'm ready to go. I haven't done anything else, but you know, I've got the free educational content, um, you know, and I've come up with my strategy based on what I heard other people do that have actually been doing it. Yeah. So I, I got the letter. I can send you the wire instructions so that you can go ahead and fund this opportunity and we can be partners. But it, I, I don't want you to do it without Joseph, though. So, you know, you guys chat about it and I'll send over that wire information so we can get this thing rolling. Yeah. It's ridiculous, right? Yeah, that's crazy. Very ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, Connor's a little fella. I'm, I'm a lot bigger than Connor, but I don't think anybody's going to battle me. I mean, <laughs> it's never an MMA fight. Like, yeah. But I mean, it's the same thing, right? And maybe yeah. you're not going to fight Connor McGregor, but let's say you want to go take down a 100-unit apartment building in the Southeast with a value-add opportunity where, you know, in a high-growth area, like every other mentorship kid or a person in the country yeah like, brokers don't take you seriously especially no, no. when what have you done um well i got a single family home the banks looked at me the same way when i went in and said the same thing to them the banks are your biggest financial partner if you don't have any experience guess who's not going to fund the brokers don't want to share any deals with you because they know that the banks aren't going to fund so now 
what do you do to bridge that gap? And for me, I call it getting tuna in the boat. Like, stop going and hunting Moby Dick, right? Get your fishing boat and go out and catch some tuna. Yeah. Some tuna. See if you like being on the ocean and getting a bob. See if you need the drama mean so you don't get seasick. Like, go out there and see if you actually like being in the ocean. And if you like being in the ocean and you catch some tuna and you bring them back and everybody's sitting and asking, hey, what'd you catch? And you can show them you got all this tuna, you filled up the boat and you go out again and you, you come back and the, the tuna is the money, by the way, right? You, yeah. got all, you, you keep going back out. Then they're like, hey, can we go out with you? That's how you get investors. Yeah. Like, by track record, a proven track record, not by, oh yeah, I got this amazing idea and I want you to fund it. The thing that I learned that was probably the most painful lesson is the bank doesn't fund dreams. The bank funds proven business plan. They're not in the business of losing money. Absolutely. That is true. I love what you said about that experience component too, because I think a lot of people, they only look at, you know, having a deal, having the money, and then maybe having some knowledge, but that experience component is so valuable. And it's helped me out so much too, because whenever I meet somebody who's super experienced in something, I don't even just ask them to teach me. I say, hey, could could you actually help me do this deal? Like be a part of it, or I could be a part of your next deal. But like actually being in the boat with the person who's gone out and actually brought back results. And it's something that is, I think, super, uh, you know, underestimate it and if more people did it like you could scale your career so much quicker because you know now your investors aren't investing in you they're investing in you and that guy Mm -hmm. and then the bank is not just funding you it's funding you and that guy you know and that guy might be you know holding most of the the experience but you get to kind of you know right along with that person to uh, basically build up your reputation and things of that nature. Yeah. The one thing I'll add on top of that, because a lot of people will hook you with, hey, raise money for my deal. But if you're not signing the loan, yeah, don't get bank experience. And it's not widely shared because it's easy to get money raisers to say, oh, yeah, awesome. But then if your name's not signed on any of the documents, you're not getting the experience. And I just want people to be very clear about that because I think people are getting taken advantage of just like when they say, Hey, put your money in a deal as an LP knowing good and well, they want to be operated. Locking the company up for five years doesn't do them any good. You can get those reports other ways. You don't have to put your money into a deal to get a report, right? You put your money in a deal to, to run a deal and be part of the GP. Absolutely. And that's a really good takeaway too, especially when you're you're trying to build that track record and people will ask you for proof. Uh, that's something that's huge to be able to show those documents. And that's something, I, I, I raised money for one deal where I wasn't on anything and it like, it helped like just enough to get to that next stage. But having your name on those documents would have, you know, bumped your credibility up, bumped my credibility up way more than what it was before. So what are some of the other myths? Because you talk about, you know, the uh, the misconceptions in multifamily. What are some of those other multifamily myths that you hear all the time that just aren't necessarily correct? Yeah, I think we got the first two, right? Go buy, go big or go home. I, I don't think that's real. Um, then I think the other one is put your money in a deal as an LP and that'll get you experience. That's not a real thing. I think it just really depends on what you want out of the experience. If you, (laughs) I I pause because I'm going to say it is controversial, right? Everybody's to the I quadrant. Why is everybody rushing to the I quadrant? I, you know, if you think about the cash flow quadrant, you got self-employed, you got employee, you got business owner, you got investor. Everybody wants to be an investor, but that's where you get the lowest return. Mm-hmm. That's true. I've never heard that, but it makes dude, total sense though. Yes. <laughs> All right. I I actually I I don't I don't think I've ever actually explained this to anybody, but. Even though I like the I quadrant for kind of like egotistical and clout reasons, (laughs) at the end of the day, when it comes to making money, I definitely prefer B. And that's where I'm at right now. You do like you are an investor when you are like, you know, retired, you already, you know, you're maxed out. You don't, you don't really need the money anymore. Really. It's just there. (laughs) Well, and that's the point. 
right? We've got people who are rushing to the I quadrant. Like, I'm going to give you $10,000. Okay. And I'm going to give you $1,000 back over the course of the next year. Is that exciting for you? Or can you invest that back into your business and double or triple, triple that? Like, do that. Like, I'm going to deal with me, but go do that. Yeah. And, you know, oh, yeah, well, you know, I'm an investor. My money works for me. But you don't have enough critical mass in order to actually make something substantial happen. And so my point is, you know, be a business owner. And this is why we talk about doing joint ventures instead of syndications. Great. You can be a passive investor in syndication all you want. If that's what you're looking for, great, go do that. But if you want to be an operator, you want to be in a situation where you own more of the deal so that when you get to play with the equity, you get a bigger chunk of the equity on the backside, in addition to whatever cash flow that comes off of it. So, you know, for the people who own 0.1% of a deal because they put $25,000 in a huge syndication, you're not, you don't really own that much. But if you can get ownership by finding deals, signing loans, being active as an operator, you can really make your money multiply. And for me, still being in my earning years and looking to grow to a $10 million net worth, like, why would I do anything else? I, I don't understand it other than we've told, hey, you've got to be an investor as soon as you can because that's the smart thing to do. I don't agree with that. And, you know, as much as Grant Cardone is controversial, he's saying, don't do anything until you got a hundred grand so you can go do something, right? Like yeah. put a hundred grand away and then you can actually, you have critical mass so you can go do something. But, you know, we, we got to be investors because that's cool. And yeah. I throw the BS flag on it. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. Like, and, and that's why, you know, I made a lot of the moves that I made and I never thought about it. But when you said it, I was like, oh yeah, that I am in the B quadrant. Mm-hmm. And I do prefer the B quadrant as of right now, because I think w- it being in the B quadrant, you you kind of get the best of all worlds because it's like, yeah, you put some of your money in, but it goes into your business. So you're getting exponential ter- returns on that. Then you're getting extra money from other investors uh, that's also getting put into your business. And then you employ people. And then you also probably have self-employed contractors that work for you. So it's like- So much technically, value created. Yeah. Technically, everybody works for the, the B quadrant you know at the end of the day if you really think about it so um highest return it's got the highest out of all of them it's got the highest returns like i don't know how anybody doesn't get excited about that yeah and a lot of people don't i feel like it's something that's really underrated kind of like you said it's like a lot of people they they understand and and i think and you could kind of let me know what you think about this but for me sometimes i think it's a work ethic thing because as an investor you could just put your money somewhere and then it's like hopefully you know where you put it and that person is a good steward over that money and grows it and you don't really have to do much but as a business owner it's kind of like like you you don't have the option to really sit on your butt even as a really good business owner like we're operating a couple businesses right now and they're pretty efficient to where we only have to be there physically maybe once or twice a week but at the end of the day there's so much behind the scenes that we still do and also there's i feel like there's a bigger learning curve i feel like it's e- i feel like it's harder to go from e and s quadrant to b than it is to go from b to i without question yeah it's a mindset it's a yeah. totally different mindset b and i are owners right and owners think about the world completely differently than e and s and I, the other thing i would say is like there's producers and then there's consumers and usually what happens is the people on the left side of the classroom quadrant are consumers the people on the right side are producers producers of jobs producers of uh, returns on investment, producers of all kinds of goods. Yep. Yep. And that is a totally different approach. Like when I go to this stuff and I see the sales pitch coming, I'm studying the sales pitch. I, I don't really care about their offer. Absolutely. I'm seeing how they're positioning it so yeah. that I can be a better salesperson, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought I was the only person who did that. I literally just did that the other day when I yeah. was um I was watching this video for V Shred. It's like a weight loss program. And the whole time he really was pitching and it was only pretty much like some knowledge sprinkled in there for like 10 minutes and it was like a 40 minute video and I'm like well he's just pitching the whole time so I stopped watching it so many times and then I like watched it again because I'm like I don't want to miss nothing so let me let me listen to it again and this time I'm like man he he really sold me I think I might get this (laughs) (laughs) it worked (laughs) it did 
Um, so I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about how you've been using LinkedIn, um, because I see that you're super active and you're clearly using it to some kind of advantage. So can you tell us a little bit more about like, you know, your use on LinkedIn? Yeah, my buddy Logan calls it the sauce, right? We got to put the sauce on the post so that we can get the likes and the comments. But no, I mean, I, in a post COVID world, I think there's going to be more virtual connection. It yeah. could be the meetings, but if you're used to being in a building with somebody and walking down the hall, that's probably changed pretty dramatically. Yeah. I walk down the hall at LinkedIn and I talk to people around the world, right? And I show up in their feeds and they get to consume content. And whether it's a one to one interaction or one to many, I think anybody that you talk to who wants to go to scale wants to do one to many interactions. So I can create one content, one piece of content, put a caption with it and share that with, you know, thousands and thousands of people. You know, I, I think my biggest post had close to 30,000 views on LinkedIn at this point. And it's just like, if I can do that, I get an asymmetrical return on the content that I'm producing. Yeah. And I've kind of left Facebook and Instagram behind just because in order to get that type of reach, they're forcing you to pay. For and for me, I don't think it's something that should be metered or buffer based on how much money you're willing to put behind it. And so with LinkedIn, we can have great organic conversations about things that the professionals on the network are most interested in. And for me, you know, that's real estate, that's personal development, because those are the two things that I'm most passionate about. And the people are rewarding us for providing that type of content by commenting and liking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I like, I always come back to like, man, I really should be more active on LinkedIn because I, I just get sucked into like the Instagram vortex and, yeah. and Facebook because it's so entertaining. And I'm sure a lot of other people think, you know, LinkedIn is kind of boring sometimes too, but it just seems like it is such like, that is the place to go if you're a professional. Um, like, are there any uh, specific strategies or anything specific you're doing to maximize your reach? on LinkedIn? Yeah. So before I go there, if you'll let me, let's talk about that, right? You, you're talking about entertainment. That's different than networking to do business or yeah. networking to share what your message is, your overarching message is with other people. You know, yeah. if I want to, if, if you want to talk about entertainment, like, uh, what is it? TikTok is super entertaining if you want to see people like do imitations of things that are already mainstream media, right? Like, yeah. It's controversial, but how many WAP videos are on TikTok and Instagram right now? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> and some of them are parodies and some of them are people who are really trying to do with Cardi and uh, Megan did, right? It's, it's just, you know, what do you, what do you want to consume? And yeah. it just goes back to that. And for me, you know, I, my goal is to connect with people and protect them from some of the things that I'm most frustrated with in the industry. One is educators who are getting them to buy used BMW or Mercedes with the lure that, hey, you're going to be wealthy or rich or independent on the backside of giving me the equivalent of a really nice car. Mm. And I just don't think that's a real thing. And I think there are a lot of, particularly women of color who are being taken advantage of where they're being shown this and then you got to have the experience and they know they, they don't have the balance sheet and but they want to create generational wealth for the kids and maybe their husband's working so hard that he doesn't have it or maybe they're doing it on their own and they're just trying to figure find their way through the maze yeah. and then they this investment and for some of them they probably shouldn't because they're not financially to a place where they should make that type of investment and now they've set not only themselves back but probably their kids because it's impacted so many other things right it's just this domino effect yeah so one overarching message for me is hey be really particular about who you choose for your education and make sure that you are understand where you are yeah. and apps in between where you are and where you want to go if you don't have those things and you make a transaction, you're not being a business owner or investor. You're being a consumer. Yeah. And that for me is super huge. And so the strategy that I'm using to get there is connecting with people who I think are interested and deliberately connecting with the people who I think are interested in that space. Mm -hmm. And then providing them content that's dispelling the myths that are not true. And you asked me this question earlier and one just popped into my head based on this. And the whole idea that you can be an investor with no money is a myth in my opinion. 
I, I know people wholesale, right? And people call yeah. that investing, but that's marketing. Like yeah. if we down that's the a business if you do it right. Yeah. Not adding any value. All you're doing is shining it up and presenting it to somebody that has yeah. money. And you've convinced in negotiation, right? You you negotiate it down on one side, you negotiate on the other side, and you take the gap. Yeah. Um, and so, but if you're investing back to like you gotta be super financially fit. And I want people to understand. And I just made a post about it. And then one of the leading educators in the country, the same day dropped a video and said, how you can buy apartments with no money down. It's an event strategy. And what what we what we're seeing happen is people getting preyed on who don't have the experience they need in order to make an educated decision. And this is why the SEC is like bearing down on the people who are just yeah. raising deals instead of being actively participants they are trying to protect people yeah. like let's be clear about it, right and sure they're adults sure they can go get guidance but if they come in and this person comes off as if they are trustworthy with only the intent to sell them something that they can't actually perform against i have an issue with yeah it. so the other piece of the strategy is just showing up authentically as me right going back to the red pill my self-image is this and so i thought it was funny i, I taught an 11-week course last fall um, going through our approach to multifamily investing and one of the guys from the course came over to dinner he's like wait you're like just like you were when we were in class i was like what did you expect me to do? Like, <laughs> Just like if somebody meets me after they see me on LinkedIn, like I am this, I show up the same way wherever I go. And yeah. it's like, you know, sometimes people want to put on suits and ties and pretend like they are this, but no, yeah. I mean, like if you find me on a random Tuesday, I'm going to be in my red pill shirt with some jeans and some sneakers on. And we can have the same conversation because, you know, my attire isn't indicative of my intelligence. My attire, yeah. my hair and like my tattoos, like none of that stuff has anything to do with my ability to deliver on the business plan that I create or you know my experience or lack of experience or education and I think we've just gotten so caught up in this whole rapper like, thing like the rapper for who I am my true essence that part of intention is to show up this way so that we can dispel some myths right because for those people who are on LinkedIn in particular who don't live in an area where they experience anybody with dreads and tattoos I'd like for them to have a warm fuzzy feeling about the one person person that they know with dreads and tats, right? Just because yep. joy breaking stereotypes and giving people something other than what the mainstream media gets. And so everything is pretty intentional in the approach, but it's still authentic to me. I'm, I'm not waving a banner. I'm not trying to create a platform. I just want people to know, be careful about who you choose for your education because I don't want you to get to take advantage of because I'm the guy that gets to call after somebody spends $35,000 and they haven't done the deal in two, right? It's like, how can I get another deal done? Because this person promised me fame and riches and I can't even get anybody to partner with me on the deal and oh by the way I haven't done any work on myself and all they've told me to do was call broke like, that is like extremely frustrating and then being authentic to who I am so the world can decide whether they like me or not and I'd rather somebody to say hey I don't like him before I spend time talking to him right because yeah. what That's a good they're point. doing for me Yep. Wow. That that literally happened to me yesterday. I hopped on the phone with somebody. I made a post about it. She told me to take it down because I was being a little harsh. But I got on the phone with somebody and uh, like I'm in the private equity space. So I was I was basically making an offer to either buy their company or like invest in their company like as a partner. And they were like they were rude to me for whatever reason. And I I felt like for a hot second I felt upset about it. But at the same time, I after thinking about it, I was like, you know what? But that's a good thing that he was rude to me because if I would have caught him on a good day and he wasn't rude to me, then what about the guy that caught him on a bad day? And now I'm this guy's partner and he doesn't know how to answer a phone correctly and have proper phone etiquette. So I'm kind of glad that I come on this day because I feel like who you are on a bad day matters because you're going to have one mm. in business. And that was definitely somebody I wouldn't want to do business with on a bad day. Um, and I'm lucky to have business partners where I, I've seen them have bad days days. And at the end of the day, they're not going to jeopardize like our company or our uh, culture or anything like that, because you know, whatever happened at home. So when you talk about people doing the, doing the uh, filtering for you, it's so, so true. Um, and, and it works. And you dodge bullets that way. I've dodged several. <laughs> All right. So you've given us so many great nuggets on this podcast episode. I mean, we talked about personal development. I didn't even expect 
perspectives really speak on that, but it was awesome. And I believe that it is so important that people go through that process when in business, because your business is just not going to thrive without it. We talked about multifamily. Uh, what is the number one takeaway that you want somebody to get from this podcast episode? Something I haven't talked about, right? Okay. And it's going to be that your dream should be real, right? Like, I, we talked about, you know, kids stop dreaming and you get yeah. beat up and you don't have support as adults. But if you haven't heard it as an adult, your dream should be real. Yeah. And there's somebody that you haven't met who's counting on you to do the thing that you were placed on this earth to do. And if you don't do it, you're going to prevent them from doing the thing that they need to do. And without that charge, I think people can just put it on the shelf and kind of mail it in and say, oh, yeah, well, you know, the situation wasn't conducive for me to do it. But knowing that, you may be letting some other people down in the world that you might, who might be the person that saved somebody's life or might invent the cure for whatever disease there is. I think it takes things to a new level. And I, I want people to be saddled with that because I do think that we're placed here to be in that top level of the red pill, which is significance, right? We want to make a big impact on the world. And if we don't do our thing, that thing that we're here for, that mission that we're on, then I think we leave the world in the limbo when we should. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And that's really deep too. It's a really selfless way to look at your dreams. Because I think some people think that their dreams are all about them. But at the end of the day, it's, it's so much bigger than you. And I like looking at it like that because sometimes, if truth be told, I feel like a lot of people might not necessarily care about themselves enough to make their dreams come true just mm -hmm. for themselves. So having that other person in the back of your mind um, will help you push through those hard times where he's like, oh, I just, I just don't want it for myself. What I've noticed is that even in times where you might not want it for yourself, you might want it for your kids or you might want it for your spouse. Mm -hmm. And that motivation, like, it's so powerful that it, it doesn't go away. Because there's times where it's like, I just ain't got the motivation to do anything <laughs> business-wise. But like when I think of Jasmine needing my help, then it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to get it done, you know? So it's just a more powerful motivation. Mm -hmm. um, how, whether it be in your business or in your personal life or in your spirituality, regardless of what it is, how do you choose to spread abundance in the world? I'm going to do it right now, right? Because of what you just said, right? That level of transparency and authenticity about, you know, your wife being an inspiration for you to keep going and to do things and to say, like, sometimes I just don't want to do it. And if it was just on me, I wouldn't do it because I don't want to, right? Yeah. Like that right there, it, it drills home. And so for me, the abundance that I share with the world is encouraging people to give more of that because there's so much that we can learn from our failures and our mistakes, but that's the stuff that everybody wants to hide. Nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to talk about the struggles or the challenges or, you know, when they weren't perfect, you know, your hair's got to be perfect. You, you got to have your beard brushed and all this stuff. And the reality, yeah. like, I didn't wake up like this, regardless of what Beyonce said. I, I didn't wake up like this. Right. There's some things in order to get to this place. And everybody's out there emulating the result instead of the process. Yeah. And so, so I give is helping people unpack the process so that they can replicate the process and get the result that they think they desire. That's so true. I love, I love it. that. Yeah. It because wow, that this whole podcast is just so insightful. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure our listeners absolutely loved it. So if they want to get coaching, um, if they maybe just want to meet you on LinkedIn or you know, just have a brief conversation with you. Uh, maybe they want to invest with you. How do they get into contact with you or your team? Yeah, I think at the highest level, the best place for them to go is JeromeMyers.co. So J-E-R-O-M-E. M-Y-E-R-S.co. And they can get exposure to everything. I mean, we've got two live events that we do. And I know live events aren't all the rage right now, but <laughs> we've got two live events that may be hybrid events in the future, but still things that we, we like to get people together. Um, and then we've got our different operating companies so that they can learn more about that. And if they got interest in real estate education, they can go down that hole too. So JeromeMyers.co and then connect with me on LinkedIn, guys. I'm going to give you content every single day. I, I don't take days off of LinkedIn. I'm going to give you something every single day. And, you know, 
hopefully it's it's a little edgy to force you to think a little bit and challenge the status quo because I mean that's what it's about for me it's about being contrarian and taking a different path I mean I took the red pill and I encourage everybody else to do the same absolutely absolutely that's awesome so man I appreciate you coming on to our podcast the abundant culture podcast today uh like I said before we talked about so many great topics and I feel like The thing that I like about you is that you're so much bigger than just real estate. Mm -hmm. And I think on on a surface level, somebody may look at you as like, oh, the black multifamily guy. But Mm -hmm. in reality, you know, you you talk about the matrix, the red pill, uh, personal growth and development. And and you tie that in with real estate so perfectly. And I feel like it's much needed because I feel like kind of like you said, with those other programs and those other gurus and educations and things of that nature, I feel like in those things, it's all about uh, what you should do as opposed to who you should become in order to have the result that you actually want to have. And I think you bring that 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 different perspective to the marketplace. And I truly appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that, brother. A lot of people get confused by that, right? Because it's not the thing that's mainstream. It's not getting pumped. You got to dig a little bit deeper and think a little little bit harder. And for some people, that's just too much work. They just want the thing where they can swipe the card and it's taken care of in a transaction. Yeah. Going off the level of truth. That's awesome, Absolutely. man. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. So that's all we have for today, folks. I hope you got as much value out of this as we did. Keep in mind, the only way we can improve is through constructive feedback. So remember to rate and review this episode. Also, you are not the only person that needs to know this super valuable information. So be sure to subscribe and share as well. Stay tuned for the next episode. And remember to always spread abundance. Peace.